This is a D6 Generation Pep, bite-sized content for a busy gamer. Sometimes featuring Craig, sometimes featuring Russ. Hey, what about me? Oh yeah, and sometimes featuring Rafe, ah, uh, Hollywood Granger. Hey everyone, welcome back to another D6G Pip, and as uh, I like to do lately, you know, we try to slip in, uh, for those who haven't been following along on the Pip system lately, uh, we try to slip in an episode of our live play Dungeons and Dragons campaign every other episode, and then we try to slip in, uh, you know, general gamer conversation, and you know, not too long ago, I was at Gen Con, got some good hotness there, been talking about some of those games, uh, but actually, when I got back from Gen Con... A, a new game came out, uh, and actually, that's not correct. A new version of an old game came out. I don't want to call it a reprint. I mean, it's I guess it's I guess it's kind of a reprint, but it's almost like a a, a reboot, if you will. No, well, uh, anyway, same designer, new publisher, a game that, uh, and I don't know that we've ever done this on the show before. Maybe we have. I'm trying to remember. Well, you guys will tell me. Uh, but we've actually reviewed the original version of this game when it came out way back in 2013. That's right. I'm talking about the game, the 4X game, Clash of Cultures. This game originally came out way back in 2013, and we reviewed it on the D6 Generation episode 121 back in the original format of the show with all those segments. It was a four-hour episode. That's right. Uh, we reviewed the game. Uh, we liked it a lot, gave it very high marks, but there were a few areas where we dinged the game. Now, what's interesting about Clash of Cultures, uh, for those who may not be familiar, is that um, it is a, uh, as I mentioned, a 4X civilization building game. Uh, and for those who aren't into the uh, civ building lingo, right? 4X stands for, and by the way, the term 4X is not just a board game term. It's also a video game term. Uh, and it, tans for, it stands for... Explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate, right? So you for a game to be a 4X game, there has to be some element of exploration. You can't have perfect knowledge of the environment <clears throat> that you are growing into. There has to be some expansion. You're going to grow your civilization or your empire or whatever. Uh, you need to be exploiting the land, harvesting resources, things like that. And then, of course, there needs to be an exterminate option. You need to be able to kill people, right? So classic versions of this, StarCraft, WarCraft, you know, there are TS uh, video games. Of course, the Civilization video game is one that really started it all. And of course, there's quite a few board games. And since we originally reviewed this game back in 2013, I've sort of become, um, well, there's really, I don't really consider myself a board game collector. Um, I try to consider myself having a large, I do have a collection of board games, but I hope that I play the games in my collection with some kind of frequency, right? So I don't just collect games to collect them. I really try to have uh, a, a wide variety of different kinds of games, whatever suits my mood, the play time, the player count, play style, the theme for the evening, whatever. Um, but there are two genres of games that I have found that I, uh, well, let's be honest, I collect these genres, right? I have, I don't follow the, uh, the, the old adage that you should try to have one of each type of game. That's the best version of that type. Um, I do kind of believe in that adage, except when it comes to, 4X games and dungeon crawling games. I generally have more than I need of those two categories. So it was interesting to me when Clash of Cultures came up for re-release, uh, reboot, uh, or whatever. Republishing, I guess, is the best way to say it. Because um, I liked the original a lot, but I've been getting into other 4X games since then. You know, since then... Uh, I believe we've had two editions of Eclipse, for example, uh, since then, um, you know, predating, uh, that would be like games like Rune Wars and the Starcraft board game. Um, I have both of those also. Um, I have, uh, I have Civilization, the board game from Fantasy Flight. Forbidden Stars is the Warhammer 40,000 sort of version of this. So I have a lot, I'm looking around my, my pile of games here, a lot of different games sort of in that genre, many, many more that I, that I don't own too. Uh, and so I was wondering, like, would 
I still enjoy Clash of Cultures. But what's interesting, even all these years later, the reprint of it, the republishing of it, kind of got me thinking about the original again, which I, to be fair, I hadn't played in a while. And I remember there was a thing I really liked about the original, two, several things, uh, even though I hadn't played it in a while, and a few things that I um, didn't love about the original, and they were relatively minor, but they were enough for me to um, look elsewhere. Uh, I still was happy to own the game and I never got rid of it. It's still in my collection. In fact, I'll try to put a picture up when we publish this episode of both the original Clash of Cultures box, which I own, uh, along with the new um, Clash of Cultures Monumental Edition, which is the new edition of the game that just came out that I do, in fact, own because it released in the middle of October and I was like, bought. bought. <laughs> so um, a couple things about the original uh, that I was concerned about back then. And so I'm going to actually play for you the feedback, the ratings we did way back in 2013 from episode 121, both my thoughts on it, as well as our guest Dan's thoughts on it. And then later when we sum up, I'll also share some of Craig's thoughts on it. But Dan and I both had similar thoughts in a couple areas. And, and here we go. I'm going I'm to play those for you right now. I just keep looking at the cover and I'm like, no elephants? I know. So I think I would have to get some elephants. Luckily, I have a bunch from the <laughs> prototype. The only cons to this game, I think it's a great 4X. I really do. I'm with Craig on this. Um, the components are weak in some areas, especially the, the, the wonders. They're kind of lame. Uh, also, the, um, as Craig mentioned, the, the player aid cards could be a little thicker. The rule book, I would like to see a quick reference sheet. And there is a distinct lack of elephants in this there game. Is. There should be more elephants. Yes, that's right. Both Dan and I had grave concerns, grave, grave concerns, that there were no elephants in the game. Now, you might think, Russ, elephants, really? I mean, you're going to ding a game on elephants. Um, yes, yes, I am. If you're going to have artwork of elephants on the cover of your game, you should have elephants in it. I mean, elephants with howdas are just so much fun. You can't tease me with elephants and howdas and not have them in there. Actually, there were a couple other things in there, too. The elephants were sort of a, a semi-joke, but kind of serious also uh, the other two things about it that was missing it didn't have a few other things uh remember i didn't like i didn't love the wonders didn't look so great uh and there were no player aids um and the one other thing which we didn't mention back then uh but it did bother me a little bit even after we reviewed the game um and i don't think i noticed it so much because we had just played it only once or twice and we we're still focused so focused on the mechanics it didn't occur to me until later after more playthroughs. And that was, there's no asymmetric factions in the original Clash of Cultures. All the factions are identical. Now, the that's kind of neat though, right? I mean, it's kind of neat because you, the path you choose as a player, it's almost like you invent the culture, right? You, you choose the tech trees, you choose whether or not you're gonna be a seafaring folk or spend your time on the land. So kind of in a way, um, you know, it, it was kind of more pure without it, to be honest, but um, I missed it. Anyway, unbeknownst to me, I missed this completely. There actually was an expansion for Clash of Cultures in the mid-teens, right? Somewhere around 2015 or so, uh, this expansion came out that apparently fixed everything, but I never got it. And apparently a lot of people didn't get it because it sold out super fast and it was impossible to get after that and it never did another printing. So... Clash of Cultures expansion apparently fixed it all, but then went away. So fast forward now to 2021, when now somehow magically WizKids has the designer and the license for Clash of Cultures. So they reprint it instead of Z-Man Games, who originally did a great job on it back in 2013. And in the new edition, it's a much deeper box with fantastic box control that holds all the bits, but more importantly, they fix some key things. One, it includes the expansion, and apparently the expansion fixed a lot of things. Now, I don't know how much of this that I'm gonna tell you that comes in the box now came from the expansion, and how much of it actually uh, is new to the Monumental Edition, uh, because I've never seen the expansion myself, so I don't know. All I can tell you is, if this sounds cool to you, you can get it now, because you can find it in stores and online everywhere that uh, WizKids Games has stuff sold, which is pretty much everywhere now. Uh, but, the expansion now adds more plastic to the game. So in the original game, you only had one kind of warrior. It was just sort of an infantry unit, right? And this would be part of your army. But now in the expansion, right, or in Monumental Edition, let's just call it Monumental Edition because you can't buy the expansion anyway anymore. So if you get Monumental Edition now, 
A few of the things I dinged the game on earlier are fixed. First thing I said, there's no quick reference cards. Now there are. Each player has their own quick reference card that really is very efficient and has everything you need on it. And playing it through with my daughter, she got it easily. It was all right there. We barely had to look at the rule book except for a couple of deeper questions and we knew exactly where to go. It was fantastic. Secondly, um, I mentioned that the uh, the monuments, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the wonders were somewhat less than stellar because they were cardboard. Now they are cool golden bits that lock into your city. So for those of you who have never seen Clash of Cultures, what makes Clash of Cultures, the original edition and the new one, one of the cooler Civ builders is how you actually build your cities on the game board. Uh, you build it with plastic. And so you start off with this, this little circular settlement round piece that looks like a couple of small tents or maybe small huts. Um, and that's the center of your city. So whenever you found a new city, you put one of these things on there. But as you add to your city, maybe you're going to add a port to it so you can launch and create ships there. Or maybe you're going to add a temple to it so you can spread your religion more. Or maybe you're going to add a fortress to it so it defends itself better. These things are actual different plastic pieces that are in your color. And they, they're they cut in such a way that they're basically a pie slice with a hole in the middle so you can attach them your, your centerpiece of your civilization, that round piece, stays on the table and you keep adding these guys to it and they encircle your city and they do a couple things. First of all, they make your city look like it's growing in a really cool way. Second of all, there's a limit to the number of these things. So as you build them, you, you're not going to be able to add everything to every single city. And thirdly, now, the, 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 the wonders are now golden versions of this, that instead of being in your player color, they're pure gold. Uh, well, not actual gold, they're plastic, but they're painted gold. And they look really cool. And they're really great 3D representations of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon or, you know, the, um, the Great Pyramid or, you know, whatever. So uh, the Great Wall, um, and they all have different effects. They're all super hard to build. Um, really interesting there. But the other thing they did um, there are new military unit types, including, wait for it, elephants. That's right. You got to have an elephant noise if you're going to have elephants. Um, they actually added several different types of military units. They added, um, your infantry is still there. Uh, they've added elephants. They've added cavalry. They've added, um, and uh, I think that's it. Elephants, cavalry, infantry. Uh, I feel like there's one more, well, there's ships, but there's always been ships. Oh, and then leaders, more about leaders in a second, which is also a plastic piece. There's only one plastic piece for a leader though. So you can only ever have one leader uh, piece on the table at a time. Um, but then in addition to all that, um, they've added um, a new uh, NPC faction. So there was always barbarians in the game. The barbarians uh, still work the same way. So there's these event cards that occur in the game. And some of the event cards have icons on them in the top. And these icons then will cause NPC activity uh, depending on sort of the condition of the board at the moment. So maybe if there's no barbarians, it will spawn them. If there are barbarians, it might move them to attack the nearest player, that kind of thing. The barbarians have leveled up in the monumental edition. First of all, they also have different military unit types. So in addition to the regular infantry in their cities, they also have access to elephants and cavalry. Um, and they've added, and this was not in the original version, in the original version, the barbarians were land-based only, but in the monumental edition, and apparently this is in the expansion, but we won't worry about the expansion anymore because it's dead to us. Uh, the barbarians were um, were also augmented with the naval power known as pirates. The barbarian pieces are all gray. The pirates are only navy power and they're, and they're black. I think they did that so there's no confusion um, because they're basically sea barbarians, but this way it's, it's a great mechanical difference uh, in terms of visual... Um, and as well as sort of graphic design, because when there's an activity for pirates, you never get confused and try to move the barbarians because they're gray. And when there's a barbarian activity, you never get confused and move the pirates. So basically the pirates are in the sea. They start to do things like while they're out there, it makes it, you can't harvest the uh, the sea resources they're on. They block trade routes. So basically you're going to go want to kill them. They will uh, eventually attack you too, if you're not too careful. The good news is killing barbarians and killing pirates does uh, get you gold as well, which is great. So there's a good reason to go do it. In addition to the fact that you're just clearing the board of them, giving yourself more, more resources as well. So that was another great addition, but the other big addition, and they didn't skimp on this at all, um, is they've added types of cultures now, right? So there is now asymmetric play and how this works is actually surprisingly deep. I was shocked by this. Like there is a, a lot, a lot. In fact, I'm going to try to look it up in the rule book here. There are a lot of different cultures, civilization boards. There are 15 different civilization boards, which means there are 15 different civilizations, 
each of these civilizations has three different leader cards. So there's 15 different civilizations, each with three different leader cards, and each of these civilizations has this hard cardboard sieve board as well. Now, the reason this is really interesting is in the uh, in Clash of Cultures, the board game, each player has a really nice, thick, very large cardboard player map that goes in front of them that has some quick reference stuff on it, but most of it is your giant tech tree. Okay, so the top of this giant cardboard board is, is the numbers, is sort of these big numbered areas, one through seven, and that's where you put all your resource tokens. So like many games do nowadays, you're, you track your resources not by actual, like if you have five food, you don't have five food tokens. If you have five food, you have one food token that you move to the five space, right? And if you have two gold, that gold token will be in the two space. So you can quickly glance at this and see how much you have there, which makes it really, really easy. Uh, also to spend and get new stuff is really easy too. Just don't knock the board over and move all your tokens around because that'd be bad. Uh, but below that are all these little areas with these little cutout squares where you're going to put your colored cubes that match your player color, the wooden cubes, I think they're plastic cubes now in this version, plastic cubes into these slots to indicate which technologies you have purchased for your civilization. And by putting your cube there, it not only gives you the name of the technology, but also uh, a nice description in terms of game mechanics of what it does. So the game has very much emergent complexity where the game is pretty simple when you start, but as you unlock more of these technologies, like the whole idea of trade routes and how they work, that's really just right there on your little technology card as soon as you, you unlock it. So that was all original to the game. Um, but what they've done now is the each of these factions have one of these, have 15, not each, but but all the factions of these different, um, what they call uh, civ cards. And so you're going to get this civ board and it's made of the same cardboard as your big technology tree mat. It's just small. And it goes next to your technology tree. And this is, a, usually they have, uh, looks like four different technology unlocks that occur. And you put your cubes in there as well whenever you unlock certain technologies on your main tech tree, right? So it depends on the faction. So for example, uh, I'm trying to remember now, but um, let me look at this one here real quick. My eyesight's gone. I'm getting old. Like if I look at a rule book, now I get to my glasses off. It's really embarrassing. I'm looking at Rome right now. So for example, when Rome unlocks the engineering upgrade, which is on their main tech tree board and everybody, by the way, uh, has the same engineering upgrade, they can get it. So when Rome gets the engineering upgrade, it also unlocks from the same time aqueducts. So when a Rome player unlocks the engineering cube, he's also going to put a free cube in his aqueducts and the aqueducts are going to give him a special buff to his civilization that no one else will have access to. See, it's pretty cool. And I played uh, in the game I played, I played India, which was super cool because when I got husbandry, it meant I could unlock elephants for my army earlier than anyone else. And I... I actually randomly got India, and I was super excited because I got elephants right in my first playthrough of Monumental Edition. Got them very, very much earlier than everybody else would have, and I was running around the board with elephants, so my dreams were fulfilled. Monumental Edition only did that for me. So that's really awesome. And then the other part that's really cool about that, so first of all, now certain technology upgrades basically for certain sieves do more for them than other sieves, right? So everybody's a little different there. But the other thing that happens is there's these leader cards. And these leader cards tie to that new plastic military unit that's a leader, right? And so when you when you recruit a leader and there's a nice quick reference board, as I mentioned, this is much better. Every player's also got a nice card stock quick reference board that has um, what they do in their turn, what happens in the status phase, uh, the military, the, the cost to build all the upgrades for your civilization, the cost to build all the military units, what the special rules are for other military units. It's fantastic. They really, again, it's like, I'm just like, I don't want to say we influence the gaming industry at all on the show because I don't think we do. But the fact that everything we said back then is exactly what they did is awesome. So thank you, uh, WizKids. <laughs> um, so what's really cool about the um, the leaders is, when you go ahead and build your leader, which again, the cost for building him is right there on your quick reference card. So you build your plastic leader, but he's got a special rule where when you build your plastic leader, not only does he have all the combat stats that are listed on the little quick reference card, you also now get to look at your three leader cards that are unique to your civilization. So when you choose your civilization, which you can do by shuffling through those 15 different tech, uh, civ tech cards and handing them out or picking yourself or whatever you guys want to do for that, uh, you're also going to get your three leader cards for your sieve and you get to choose which leader you're going to spawn, right? And they're each three unique people. So if you're playing the Huns, you might have Attila, for example. Um, so they're all people you might recognize if you really know your history, but some of these civilizations, you got to really know your history to, to recognize them. Um, but the one I spawn for my Indian civilization, 
His special abilities, usually they have one of, they have two abilities usually. They're not all the same though. So some of them break this rule, but generally they each have, one of them has sort of a cool combat ability and one of them has a cool sort of non-combat ability. So my, um, my leader's cool ability was every time he entered one of my own cities, the civil, the, the people would pay tribute and I gain one gold. So just by walking him around and visiting all of his cities and doing his little princely, well, hello, my people, my citizens, how are you all today? I would generate revenue for my, my, my civilization. You know, my fluff was kind of my head. I'm like, I'm getting the people to work harder because they get to see my glory, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it was really cool. It was like a neat mechanic. And I remember... Uh, my daughter had a completely different leader who did a completely different thing for her that really helped her with her whole, um, she had the Phoenicians, which had their alphabet going on there and um, all kinds of cool uh, naval power. <clears throat> What's also kind of interesting, also the third thing that's unique about the civilization. So um, the, 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 the asymmetric play of the civs did three things. The first thing it did, again, the technologies, the unique technology board for each civilization, it's like a sideboard. The second thing is the three leader cards. They can only have one leader out at a time. Um, but if your leader is slain, your enemy is going to get that leader card, which they can keep later for victory points. But, uh, then you could spawn a new different leader, right? So you can change your leader out over time if you, if you need to, uh, the third, the third thing that's different is not all the civilizations, but some of the civilizations have a unique starting tile. So in the base game, in the game without uh, the monumental edition, uh, bonus stuff, um, you all start with the exact same starting tile and then the rest of the board is, uh, built with tiles face down. So that's the explorers part. You're not going to know, um, the, what the rest of the world looks like, but in, uh, if you're playing these, um, with, uh, unique civilizations, some of the civilizations, not all of them, but some of them have a unique starting tile. So for example, the default starting tiles, none of them have a water hex on them. But for certain civilizations, like especially heavily seafaring civilizations, like the Phoenicians or the Vikings, they in fact do have a water tile available to them right off the bat. Um, so a lot of cool stuff like that going on there. So again, really cool asymmetric play. And this really um, added, they really covered everything. The two things I criticized on the show about them back in 2013 and the thing I did not criticize, which was the lack of asymmetric civilizations. Now, if you're a purist, if you're like, well, man, I just like the original one. I just like the idea of the gold buildings and maybe the quick reference cards and maybe, well, the cool part is you can play it with or without the, the, the new expansion elements. So they've done a really good job in monumental edition here. They use the, 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 the less than sign, the left bracket sort of less than sign situation, uh, throughout the quick reference cards and in the rule book, to tell you it's this, these rules, this stuff is part of the expansion. And actually the quick reference card is reversible. So on one side are the quick reference rules without any of the new stuff, right? So it's basically true to the original. Yes, there's also been some rules tweaks in the monumental edition. Um, just things that made a little better, smoother, cleaner. Uh, honestly, I don't remember all those, but, but the quick reference card handles that for you. So the new edition has all that stuff. But then if you flip the card over, you get all the, uh, cool rules like the specialized military units, the asymmetric civilizations and all that kind of stuff as well. So, uh, I'm really couldn't be more pleased with, uh, the component, the quality upgrade for this game, like the original game. I love the original game. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, except for the lack of elephants, but in the new edition, you get, you get two amazing box control trays that hold all the plastic, even sorted with a nice clear cover so that the plastic doesn't shoot everywhere. So all your sieves, um, are in there. Uh, you got room. In fact, I labeled everything. Um, there was even, uh, I think I may have had to grab a couple plastic baggies to keep the cubes together, but that was it. Like it's really all fits back in the box. It doesn't shoot all over the place. It's nice, neat and tidy, makes setup really cool. So, uh, there's even a, a vacuum form thing that holds all the, 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 what's interesting about the game is the game board is actually not a board. You actually build it out of these tiles and the tiles are uniquely shaped. They're sort of like, imagine, um, a set of hexes, but they're kind of like uh, two, three, two. So they're kind of like wider in the middle. And so they got this oblong sort of shape and they have this great vacuum board thing that holds them all, which is which is really nice. Um, so all the box control is great. The only the only ding I would give against it now, and it's and it's actually, it's kind of not a ding. It kind of depends on, on you um, from a component's point of view. Arts, by the way, art's fantastic. Card quality is right there. There's brand new um, D12 custom dice that includes icons on the D12s 
because the icons now activate special abilities of the military unit in the combat situation. So the military units, they basically all fight the same. You just count the plastic, roll the dice, but the dice have icons on them that match different unit types. So if your die rolls up an elephant head and there's an elephant in the battle, your elephant special ability activates. Or if it rolls up a, a, an infantry helmet, the infantry special ability activates, right? This is all new with the with the monumental edition stuff. Um, so that's really slick. But again, if you don't want to use that, you can just roll the dice normally. But the D12s look fantastic, really nice, plenty of them in there for all your battle needs. Um, couldn't be more pleased with the component quality. The only little ding I would give against it, and again, I, I, I hesitate to do this because it's not really a ding because the game is very affordable. And that is the the plastic quality it's 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 um sort of classic the, the sculpts are awesome the sculpts look great each faction is not unique though so all the elephants look the same just different colors right for each faction all the all the infantry looks the same but that's fine um everything's just a little bendy though right so your your leader tokens for example have a, a flag on a pole but they're all the flags are all bent all over the place right or the spears for the infantry are all bent and curved um anything anything that can bend is bent because it's all packed just so tightly together to make it portable. So it's 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 not a ding really, because if you look at a game like um, anything from Cool Mini or not, or like the new Ankh, for example, which I've talked about in prior episodes, or or um, or Blood Rage, or anything from that's got like the hybrid game where there's miniature quality components along with an amazing board game. And I'm not dinging these games at all. I love it. But the the amount of storage you need for all this and everything's in plastic and you got to take it out of the plastic and you got to pull it out and it looks awesome don't get me wrong those models look great and they're not bent they're perfectly they look awesome but putting it away and taking it out is like it's like an exercise whereas this you just dump your pieces out and go so it's almost like you know you're treating your pieces like they're risk you know cubes but they look better than risk cubes because they're actually three-dimensional models and they look great but it's a little bendy so you got to be okay with a little bendiness could you fix them and paint them nicely. Oh, yeah, you could do the the hot water, the boiling water, cold water bath trick to straighten all the plastic out, and you could paint them up, and I'm sure they would look awesome. Uh, but then you're going to have a storage problem because if you store them the way they're designed, they're going to bend again. So it's up to you on that one. Uh, frankly, I think I I like thinking of this game and treating this game as a board game. Um, it it it's less intimidating that way. It's just it's got great table presence anyway, and the real table presence in this game, and and it still is is the Sibs itself, the little cities themselves, uh, how they grow and the culture wars that happen, right? And so um, I, I haven't spent any time at all on how the game plays because I've just been focused so much on the upgraded components uh, and how the different tech trees work. But the core to the game, and this is not this is not changed, it's the same as the original, is that in addition to, um, well, I think the thing that makes um, Clash of Cultures, the unique game it is, and everybody rave about it. Because now if you talk to anybody about Clash of Cultures, it's been around long enough where Forex fans and aficionados are going to say, oh yeah, Clash of Cultures, is pr it's probably one of the best. You know, So it's one of my top three, you know, kind of thing. And the reason is that no other game has really captured what Clash of Cultures does. Um, and I say that, and they all, all Forex games have war, have combat, right? And they all do combat to different levels of efficiency. Some of them make it too complicated, but some people love that. Some of them make it too simple and it doesn't handle different types of units well enough. I think this game strikes a good balance there. Um, it doesn't, it does have a civilization growing mechanic, but it doesn't take you through all the ages of history, right? You never really leave the, the, the swords and, and, and arrows age, right? You're, ne you're never going to get past the age of Rome, really, right? Even your most advanced part of the civilization, whereas the abstract civilization board game from Fantasy Flight, that took you all the way up to airplanes and Alpha Centauri, but to do that, it had to get very abstract, right? So this game, you're going to see your civilizations grow, but the one thing the Civ game does that I've really not seen another Civ game do very well is cultural influence, so what's really cool about this is, remember I mentioned earlier that as your cities grow, right, you're going to be adding more pieces of plastic to your city. And all these pieces of plastic are your color, right? They're different buildings, right? So you're going to be, and I'm looking at the pictures now in the book, so I, I can add uh, a temple, I can add an observatory, I can add a fortress, right? And I can add an obelisk to this. And they all have a special, unique power. Um, some of them are powers that just happen once. Like when you build it, you get a certain bonus and resources. Some of them are always ongoing. Um, but these are all your colors. So as you're growing this, right, you're a little, I must say I'm playing blue. Well, when I, when I first get my little settler, oh, the other cool piece of plastic you have is your settler, right? So your little settler gets to the spot. And then you, uh, as an action, you can replace your settler with a little, with a little settlement, the little round city disc. And then later you can, uh, during your turn, by the way, you can activate a city. So during your turn, you get three actions. Basically, you can move something. Um, you can activate a city. 
Um, and there's a bunch of things the city can do. One of the things the city can do is it can build, it can add to itself and you, you pay the cost and resources. The city, the other thing you can do when you activate a city is you can harvest resources. And just like the civilization video game, you can harvest resources from the square, the, the, the hex the city's in or any of the adjacent hexes, right? And the different hexes are different, different types of land, right? There's forest hexes and there's field hexes and there's water hexes and there's mountain hexes and different technology upgrades allow you to harvest these different hexes, right? If you don't have all the technology upgrades in your technology tree, maybe all you can do is get food out of a field hex until you research mining and then you can get ore out of mountains, for example, or that kind of stuff, right? But what's cool about this game, and a lot of games do that well, this game I would say does it particularly well. What it does really well is this whole watching your cities grow, right? So now I've got two cities and little pieces of plastic grow. And then all of a sudden my daughter's city and she's playing yellow and her little, little cities start coming across the board and there's her little yellow cities. And here's where it gets really interesting though. When her little yellow cities get within a certain range of my little blue cities, we can do what's called a cultural influence action, right? It's just one of the three actions we can do in a turn. I can activate a city and I can say this city, Actually, I don't think it's a city activation. It might be. I can't remember. But in any case, you're going to take one of your cities and it's going to activate and it's going to attempt to spread its culture to a neighboring, uh, air quotes, enemy city, right? A city that's not our own. And the range of this cultural influence is equal to the size of the city. So a lot of the things in the game, it's another great mechanic, uh, that how much a city can do when you activate it is really directly related to the size of the city. What's the size of the city? It's the number of pieces of plastic that make up the city, right? So if it's a one piece settlement by itself, it can only do one action when you activate it. So if you activate it to recruit a troop, to recruit it, to recruit army units, it can only recruit one. If you activate it to harvest resources, how many hexes can it harvest per turn? Only one, because it's one piece of plastic. But if you'd already built a building on it, right? Now it's got two pieces of plastic, so now it's size two. So when it recruits, it can recruit two different units. You still got to pay the cost for the units, but it could actually get two in one activation. Or if it needs to harvest land, well, it can harvest now from its own land and it can harvest to one, from one adjacent hex as well, because it's size two. If you built a third building in there, well, now it's size three. And there's one other cool mechanic as well. There's the happiness mechanic. So there's a, there's a set of tokens in the game that are double-sided. One side is a smiling face and one side is a frowny face. And when the city has no none of these tokens next to it, it is neutral. It's just it's just not in a mood at all. It's just feeling pretty okay. It's chilling. If you get it happy, you put a happy token next to it. Now, if it's if it's unhappy, you put a sad token next to it. A happy city does everything at one size larger than it currently is. So remember, I mentioned how many units you could build, how much how many hexes you can harvest, all that stuff. Well, it's based on the amount of plastic in your city plus one if it's happy, minus one if it's sad, to a minimum of one, right? So there's other actions you can do to increase happiness and other resources you can do all that. And I'm not going to spend all that time on this. You got to check the game out. But what's, I still haven't gotten to the part that makes the game super cool yet. So back to my cities, my daughter's yellow cities are getting closer to my city and my cities are getting closer to my daughter's cities. And that's all good. And then she's like, dad, I'm going to try out this, uh, this whole cultural influence thing on you here. I'm going to do, it's called influence culture. I'm looking at the quick reference card now. I'm going to influence culture on you. So the range of influence culture is equal to the size of the city. So she's got a size three city. She's range three. So she's going to try to influence culture on me. What she does is if she's in range of one of my cities, she's just going to roll one of these D12s. And if she rolls a five or a six, and by the way, they're D12s, but they only go up to five or six. So they're, they're custom dice. Um, if she rolls a five or a six, but the reason there's so many different sides is because there's different military symbols I mentioned. If she rolls a five or a six, she has flipped. She has culturally influenced part of my city. And then one of the pieces of plastic, one of the buildings that I've attached to the center of my city that was my color now is replaced by one of hers of her color. And now she has influenced that building. So she could change the fort in my city from a lovely blue to a less lovely yellow, <laughs> right? For example. Um, and now that's the rest of my city is blue, but this fort is yellow. Now, what's interesting about that is it's still my city. The centerpiece of the city is who owns the city. It's still my city. The fort still works for me. The fort still defends me. It's as if I own it. There's no difference except that fort just loves yellow culture, right? Um, she loves, it loves kids, my daughter kids culture. And one of the big deals at the end of the game, because the game is all about victory points. Um, one of the big victory point getters in the game is you count up all the buildings, pieces of your cities on the table and that is one victory point per piece of plastic, right? So the central settlement in the middle, plus all the buildings around it is plus one for each of your buildings. My daughter though, if she's converted some of yours, then she's going to get the victory point for those buildings that are her color. Now, later I can take an influence culture action, try to swing that building back to mine. But the interesting thing is once your city is mixed culture, 
it can't do influence culture actions beyond trying to influence itself to get itself back to being 100% your culture again. So basically, if you can get some on the, the cities that are on the border between your two kingdoms, if you can flip your opponents to be mixed before yours are mixed, now you're going to be trying to win the culture war back in your culture war back in your own city before you're trying to spread your culture elsewhere. And if she can keep that handle on it, she can keep moving. And now the cool part is you might think, well, yeah, but it's a die roll, you know, five or a six seems like a long shot. Well, there's ways you can influence that, right? So there's a resource called culture that you can get from a variety of things, trade routes, shipping, tech upgrades, all kinds of stuff. And these are tokens you can get. And you can spend these when you're doing an influence culture action to either increase the range of your culture influence or to augment the die roll plus one per token you spend, right? So there's ways you can mitigate all this luck as well. So um, there you have it. That is... Um, some of the stuff that I think makes classic cultures really amazing. It just looks so wonderful on the tabletop. The components are fantastic. It feels like you're building a civilization. And it feels like you have many ways to get victory points and win that aren't just exterminate your opponent. Of course, you're going to fight. You're going to fight the barbarians. You're going to fight each other. Um, you know, if they're your opponent just culturally beating you up over and over again and taking over, you're just going to get frustrated at some point. You're just going to evade their freaking city and take them out. I mean, that'll happen, um, which is part of the fun, right? So you could think out, well, what's a good military? How am I going to deal with that? And if you're putting all your energy into military, you're not putting it maybe into technology or maybe you're not putting it into, into um, you know, influencing other cultures or just building a, a large, robust city. So a great game. One of the things I should say about it is it can be medium long, right? It can be a nice Saturday afternoon game. Um, but there are a couple different game modes you have to speed it up. Um, the, the, the turn tracking board on the side is double-sided, uh, and there are a couple different modes you can use. Uh, so there are ways to play a much, a, a much more abbreviated version of the game as well. It's still a two hour fest, if the abbreviated version, but it takes it in from the four to the four to five hours. It could be, uh, in a large four player, you know, just spreading it all out and having a nice Saturday afternoon. Although I like those kind of games really sitting down, just everybody knows what they're getting into. And you're just going to have a nice afternoon of playing a big Civ builder. The other thing I like about it is because there's so many different ways to win and so much fun you can have just watching your civilization grow. It, it doesn't seem to bother the players as much that it's maybe there's a clear person a little bit in the lead and you're not going to catch them. You're, you're, you almost focus less on that and just like having fun. Like, Ooh, I really want to build a wonder. I don't care if I win. I just want to get this wonder bill, you know, or, or, Ooh, I really want to get elephants or, Ooh, I really want to have a trade route and have a shipping lanes. And, or I really want to get my fifth city, you know? And there's also a little uh, objective card you can get throughout the course of the game that give you sort of mini objectives, give you victory points throughout the course of the, of the event. So it's like, oh, I really want to have four happy cities or I really want to found one city five hexes away from my my starting city kind of thing, just to kind of see if you can do these sorts of achievements. So there's a lot of ways you can sort of have fun um, beyond simply, if I'm not the winner, I don't feel like I, you know, I feel like I wasted my afternoon. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that at all. It feels like there's a story, there's a, there's a whole thing that happened. Um, it's kind of funny. I, um, my daughter started influencing my city. So I sent in my ships to attack her and, um, she had just developed warships. So managed to repel me, but then she played this displo diplomacy card and made it really hard for me to fight her anymore. So this is really cool in our head. We kind of talked about the story that evolved between, you know, I tried to start a war and then she just shut it down through these peace treaties, um, and really made it a hard for me to win. And she actually ended up did winning by about five victory points. So it was a, a great little game. So I can't really speak highly enough for Clash of Cultures Monumental Edition, I think if you if you missed the original Clash of Cultures and you like 4X games, you should definitely check it out. I don't think I would change my ratings from the original episode at all here. Um, I think, um, you know, it's it's better. It's better in every way. And the new civs are there. So I might give it a plus one. So I might give it a three plus on the D6G rating system, the probability on a D6 that you're going to enjoy this game. I'd say it's a three plus uh, with a reroll if you're a 4X fan. And I'm going to end this episode with uh, Craig's final comments from the review we did uh, way back in the original episode because he summed it up pretty darn well. So Craig, what did you think? Way back in 2013, we're going to put the Wayback Machine on. We're going to hear from Craig in 2013. The way it deals with combat, the way it deals with cultural influence, the way it deals with civil civic improvements. Every, it, it seems like it kind of has a nod to everything you would need to have a good 4X game that, that has some meat to it. It's not like a just a quick throwaway game. It's not a filler game by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not like a total brain burner that you're going to be just agonizing over every moment of the game. So I would say that your average game is going to like this game on a four plus. So 50, 50 chance. Mm -hmm. 
But if you like 4X games in general, I think it's going to be a, t- a plus two on that roll. Plus two. Wow. So you're saying it's a two plus for those guys. I think if you like 4Xs, you're going to like this game. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Thank you, Craig. And I would agree with him 100%. It's still just as good. It's even better now because there's 100%, well, I guess infinite percent more elephants, as well as great asymmetric civilizations, cool new wonder bits, and that same great core, really unique. Um, you know, it's it's there in the video games, but no one's done it on a board game yet, as far as I can tell. Uh, clash of cultures. We are really having cultures clash. See you next time. In the sixth generation. Achievement unlocked. You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, You can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.